Last week, we spoke about the first paragraph of the Shema. And this week, I thought we should speak about the second paragraph of the Shema. After all, it is in this week's Parsha. So, um, um, it will be apropos, especially since, as we explained last week, and as we all know, the Shema is such an essential part of Jewish uh, prayer, foundation of Jewish faith. And therefore, the better we understand it, the better we can understand Jewish teachings in our faith and prayers. So what I actually like to do is, well, um, you know, uh, comparative religion is not something we're into, but comparative first paragraph, the second paragraph of the Shema, to see the similarities and to see the distinctions between them, something we're very much into. So I'm going to share the screen here and um, bring up I hope you can see this. I hope it's clear. The first paragraph verses the second paragraph. And if you need it larger, let me get a bit larger. Oh, okay. So in the first paragraph, you can, is on the left side, and the second paragraph from this week's Parsha is on the right side. It's all in English here. Um, and we're going to see similarities and, of course, some distinctions. So, of course, the first uh, phrase of uh, Shema Yisrael is only in the first paragraph, not in the second one. But then it comes. Um, in, in the first paragraph, that uh, that you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And you have a similar idea over here. If you study my commandments continuously, um, yeah, I'm not certain it needs to be muted, but the sunlight needs to be muted. Uh, yes, there we go. Okay, sorry. So in the uh, first paragraph, firstly, it says, uh, with all, we translate over here material means, but really ma'idecha means with your very, very, means like, which we'll explain shortly. What does it mean with your very, very what? So that's one distinction, because in the second paragraph, it says you should love God with all your heart and with all your soul, but it doesn't say with all your might, with all your ma'idecha. So that's one distinction. A second distinction is that in the first paragraph, it says, and I wrote it there in Hebrew, so you could see, bechol nafshecha. For those who are familiar with Hebrew, that is, uh, that is second person singular. Singular. In the second paragraph, it says, with all your heart and with all your soul, but that is second person plural. The entire paragraph, second paragraph, is in plural form. The first paragraph is in singular form. Now, of course, in English, we don't have this concept of, uh, of singular and plural, but in Hebrew, we do. Uh, for those who know French, even though I'm from Quebec, I don't compare those. Um, there is plural and singular forms of words, but here um, there's a distinction. Why? Then the next uh, uh, section in the first paragraph you don't have. It's it's not in the first paragraph, but you do have it in the second. What is it? I will give rain. Um, you'll gather in the grain, the wine, the oil. You can see it's underlined over here. In other words, very, and then be, furthermore, the, you're going to get reward. And if you don't listen to God, beware, lest your heart be misled and you neglect the study of Torah and the worship of incentive, uh, gods and prostrate yourselves before them. And if you do, the wrath of God will be kindled against you. So there's punishment. So the reward and punishment, first paragraph doesn't have reward and punishment. The second one does have reward and punishment. Furthermore, it says at the end of the paragraph there, you will perish. 
Um, uh, sorry, no, not a. Um, and that you will perish quickly upon the land that God has given you. So perish doesn't mean that you're going to. Um, doesn't mean that the people will perish. But you'll perish upon the land. In other words, you'll be exiled from the land. You're not going to listen to the, follow the ways of God. You're going to be exiled from upon the land. That's also something unique that's emphasized over here. You are in punishment and even the idea of exile from the land and yet there, even exiled upon the, on the land, um, is still uh, the service of God. Then continuing, um, uh, these words that I command you today, you will keep them upon your heart. That's in the first paragraph. Second paragraph, you must set these words of mine upon your heart and upon your soul. So a similarity, right? Um, also, sing, it's in plural form. But then what we have is interesting that in the first paragraph on the left side, it says, you, uh, um, what does it say? And that you should uh, learn or teach them to the students. Levanecha um, over here means to your children, but our, the Talmud says, who does this refer to? These children are your students. You can have physical, biological children, and you can have spiritual children. Those who you teach Torah to are your spiritual children. So here it's speaking about spiritual children that you will teach, right? And then in the next paragraph of the first paragraph, the on the left side, then you'll bind them as a sign, speaking about tefillin. Let's look at the right side, this week's parsha, in the second paragraph. So you see the blank over there. Why is it blank? Uh, right over here, you can see that it's blank. Why is it blank? Is because um, it doesn't speak about learning first and teaching. Then it goes into the next paragraph and you must bind them as a sign on your weaker arm, and then it must act as a reminder between your eyes. In other words, tefillin is coming, and there's no mention of the study of Torah. Oh, but wait, look at the next paragraph. You must teach them. And you must teach them to your children. Here it's speaking about your children, literally your children, to speak to them, and when you see your house, and so on and so forth. So we have a different order. In the first paragraph, the order is first learn, then do the mitzvah of tefillin. In this week's parsha, the second portion of the Shema, first you do the mitzvah of tefillin, bind them, put them between your eyes, and then you study Torah and teach. Is that clear? Anybody have any questions on this? We have clarity on uh, what we see before us. Thumbs up. You want the answer, or should we, um, like, you know, go into Shabbos? Anybody want the answer? Let's see online. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, let's give the answer. So we spoke last week about the uh, the first chapter, uh, the first first chapter, and the uniqueness of the first chapter is um, Shema Yisrael that we need to hear, we need to uh, listen, we need to understand, we need to meditate upon that God is transcendent. Hashem Echad, transcend. There's a transcendence of God. God is not only limited to nature; He's found within nature. There's an imminence of God, which means a presence um, here and now of God. But then there is at the same time a transcendence of God. And as we explained, that that transcendence is really something that's a part of our soul. And we have access to it. We have access to our, in our soul, that we can transcend the human condition. We have access in our soul that we can transcend the human condition. 
And that's what it means, Hashem. Uh, um, that Hashem is He is your power. He, the transcendence of God is something that we all have. And we see that collectively as the Jewish people and also individually. We're capable of transcending the human condition. Whatever challenges we have, if we access that part of our neshama, uh, that part, part of God that's in us, there's no telling the capability that we have and what we are um, can fulfill and what God needs of us in this world, no doubt. And because of the transcendence that we have, that's why in the first paragraph, it speaks about Vayidecha. Um, Vayidecha means you're very. What's your very? So here we translate it as your material, uh, we translate it as your material means. That's one uh, explanation. But it, what it means is that everything that you have that you're able to transcend, so it reflects itself in a, a means of transcendence. The second paragraph isn't speaking about transcendence. It's speaking about more, more the imminence of God, the uh, finding God in the uh, small things, shall we say, or the, uh, the minutia of life, the regular mundane stuff that we can find in there. Let me explain. The first paragraph is about the capacity to, to think about, meditate, concentrate, use our minds to be aware of God in such a way that it ellipses us to such a degree that we have a sense of transcendence. It is like seeing is believing. It's as if you are seeing the transcendence in you. You're living it in such a way that it's so powerful, just like seeing is believing. That is the first paragraph. It is a powerful, that it is, that there is no other reality but the presence of God. There's no other thing but your mission that you need to accomplish. You are so fixated on it. This, you, 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 you sense nothing else. Almost you're just a vehicle to the fulfillment of the divine mission that you were created for. It's, and with such clarity you have your mission set before you. And that's why it's ma'idcha, with your very, very. And that's why it's in the singular form. Why? Because this is not something that everybody can reach. There are the singular people who are capable of having that kind of clarity. That would mean we may have that from time to time, such clarity. But this is not the natural way, the simple way, but we need to know that it exists. On the other hand, the second paragraph, it's not speaking about. Well, actually, let's let's continue. Um, um, and, and because of that, in the first paragraph, the first thing that it speaks about is study of Torah and then mitzvahs. Why? Because where do you get where do you get singular clarity in your mind that produces a feeling of that you will love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might, is when you study Torah. And the more you study it, the more you engage in it, the more you're fixated on the awareness and the reality and the oneness of God in your life, then that will just naturally bring you to the mitzvah. So the first paragraph is speaking about those people who have the capacity of their, through their study, that it brings them through learning. And who do they learn with? The students who are students of Torah. The first paragraph is speaking about those who are the students of Torah, who are in a similar way, in a similar manner, that have the capacity of studying in such a way that the awareness of what they're learning, the awareness of God is so real. The awareness of purpose and meaning in life is so real that there's nothing else. Hashem Echad, the oneness of God. Complete self-abnegation. There's no sense of even self. 
You're just a conduit for the divine mission. And that's why, again, it's singular because it's so difficult. And that's why the Torah study comes first because the Torah study is the vehicle for that, right? It, it's those who, who, who truly engage in Torah study, um, you know, the scholars, the holy people that are engaged in such a manner, they have that capacity. That's the first paragraph. Second paragraph, as we mentioned, doesn't mention Mo'aydecha because there's no very, very that you're going to accomplish. You're not transcending. Here it's more about God's presence in the minutia of life, simple, small things, um, not transcendence, but within the human condition. And that's why it's plural. Bechol levavchem, sorry. Bechol nafshechem. With all of your hearts, it is second person, plural, because this is a plurality of all of us that we can achieve. We can achieve a relationship with God where we can see the consequences of what occurs in our lives. We can see that when we do the mitzvah, we get the rain in the land, we get it in the proper time. We see that when we do something wrong, that we get, you know, out of sync and things happen to us. We see the, 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 the truth and consequence. We see the consequences of our behavior, of what happens. And we see clearly the hand of God in our lives and the world around us. And that's why it speaks about reward and punishment. That's why it's necessary to speak about reward and punishment because it is about a consequence of the nature of this world. That's the nature of this world. It's cause and effect. So if the cause is a healthy cause, so then you'll get a healthy, prosperous life, a good life. If the cause is a negative one, that we uh, um, are misled and neglect, and we engage in things that are of an idolatrous nature, and then, um, yeah, we'll be spit out of the land. We'll be uh, banished. Um, and we sense that in ourselves, that when we do that's right, when, when we do what's right, um, the reward that comes with it, when we do something that's wrong, the punishment that comes with that. And this is... Um, because here, it's not about seeing a, with clarity the truth and living that truth, whether it's the truth of God or the truth of Torah or the truth of the mitzvah, whatever it is. Here, it's about hearing. Hearing's from a distance. It's about understanding. Understanding just is the mind. What does the mind understand? It understands the way of the world. The way of the world is, again, consequential. Everything has a consequence. So God will give us the rain. We do good, the opposite. At the same time, then, the, you know, the ultimately, if we really fall off the wagon, uh, God will perish us quickly from the land, from the good land, meaning not perishing us as a people, not even perishing us as an individual, but off the good land, off the holy land, of God's presence in the holy land. Even though we have the holy land today, but we have God's presence there in, in sort of the biblical sense. And we will um, we'll perish from that, meaning we will go into exile. And there we will have to serve God amongst the non-Jewish nations, amongst difficult, challenging circumstance, because it won't be the good land. Um, yet, there we will be able, we will serve him. Um, and now with that, we can understand the distinction of why the mitzvah comes first and the study of Torah comes second, and the study is speaking about to your children, not to your students. And because um, here, the learning of Torah is more consequential. Learn so you know what to do. Learn so you could be, you know, still a committed Jew. Oh, learn because now that you're going to learn, 
your awareness of God is going to be something so real. No, learn because if you don't learn, then you won't know how to, you know, to fulfill the mitzvah. If you don't learn, then you, you're going to fall away from your commitment. You know, you're not going to feel uh, a connection to God and God's, you know, and God's blessings in your life. You're not going to feel that. His imminence. So therefore, look, therefore learning. But the primary thing then becomes just, as we say, just do it. Do it. Just do it. Do the mitzvah. Do the action of the mitzvah. That is the most essential thing is the mitzvah. And the study then becomes a means towards the mitzvah in a sense. So we know how to fulfill the mitzvah. And that's why it is speak to your children means literally your children, because he, you know, in the first paragraph it's speaking about, you know, the very high level of learning and the very high level of awareness and, and, and sense of, of, of the truth of what you're learning. Well, children don't get that. They're too young. But yet they need to be taught to, because if they're not taught, then they won't do and they won't be committed as Jews. That is uh, um, uh, the, the that is the uh, basic distinction between the two. Now, um, David, can we see you? Sharon, Shoshana, Bina, it'd be nice if we could see everybody. Oh, thank you. Now, obviously, the first paragraph is a very high level and a high minded individual. And uh, although we don't, we're not there on a consistent basis, but there might be moments that the truth of God, the truth of Torah is so clear to us that we don't, we just feel ourselves to be a conduit for God's needs to be fulfilled in this world. We don't sense our own needs. We only feel his needs. There are times, not too often, but I'm sure there are times, right? In a Fabrinian, Hasidic Fabrinian, we have that those moments. You sing a Hasidic melody, you know, cleanses the soul that you could truly, truly feel that. Or a real good daven. You learn, you learn Hasidic, and then you learn, and then you go to daven, and it's a real daven that you sense and exalt in it. Or that you learn Torah on such a level. We can learn Torah on such a level. We learn it. There's no, there's no need. I'm learning. I'm getting it. Oh, that's my, I'm getting it. I'm getting it. There's the I there. On that level, there's no I. It's just you and it are one. Are one. Again, that's the ideal. It's in singular form because not you know there's a singularity that you sense there, and not all of us are going to be able to achieve that. You know, that's really a high-minded, righteous individual. Yet, we say that paragraph. Why? Because we need to know what there is yet beyond us and that we can have a glimmer of it from time to time on some, in some manner, in some way. Now, that being said, so it sounds like the second paragraph is really like a come down. Like, you know, it's for like it's for me and it's for you and it you know like it's for us uh, you know <laughs> you know who didn't make the grade you know it's for those you know non Harvard non Yale um, <laughs> you know Jews you know the non Sadiqi you know. Rabbi Rabbi who's to say who didn't make the grade we all have our own yardstick. I'm, 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 that's why I'm the teacher here, so I'm giving the grades now. <laughs> I'm, I'm taking the, the prerogative here. <laughs> I, I, I'm taking the prerogative to say that we did not make this grade, and maybe we visit it from time to time, but that we have a constant awareness, a singular clarity that there is no, that, you, that Sharon, you never get angry, that you never get any anxiety that you, you know by the way that's not even the first level that's not even the second level you know that's even the second level but you know so questions that for we're on the second level yet but we'll, we'll get there in a moment 
Um, the, the first one is, there's no such thing as anxiety. There's no such thing as, uh, uh, as being upset uh, on the first level because there's such a clarity and a oneness of God that you are, you know, you're totally present. You're totally connected. You're, 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 you're totally sensing a oneness in, you're in, in, in everything. You don't feel self even. Uh, you know, there's a beautiful story. It's told of um, the Arizals. The Arizal lived in Svat. He was, uh, he lived in, in Svat. The, the Beis Yosef, the uh, Yosef Cairo was the rabbi, the author of the uh, Shulchan Aruch. Uh, the uh, Shlomo Alkovitz was the, the Chazen. He's the one who authored the Lachad or the and uh, Rabbi Moshe al was the Darshan. And the Arizal was just, you know, he was just a Kabbalist. <laughs> Imagine the shul of these people. Oh my gosh. I don't know if anybody could enter the light, it might have been too, uh, too, uh, too powerful <laughs> to, to be in their presence. In any case, um, so Rabbi Moshe. Al Sheikh once was uh, speaking. He was the one who spoke and gave the, dr the drasha. I don't know if it's on or And he's speaking about Avram Avinu. And he, what he said, I don't know. I, I don't know. The story tells us. He told a story and said something about Avram Avinu. And all of a sudden, the Arizal walked out. Like, and it was, he walked out like, uh, like, the Al Sheikh understood that, like, you know, he did something wrong in what he was speaking and presenting it. So he um, quickly went after him, you know, what's, what's the matter? He says, you know, when you speak, and you spoke about Avram Avinu, Avram Avinu came. He came. But then, all of a sudden, when you spoke, there was a sense of self awareness that you had. That what you were saying was a very uh, significant and lofty teaching. You know what happened? Avram, Avram Avinu walked out of the, of the shul. Well, if Avram Avinu walked out, I'm also walking out. Yal Sheikh was a righteous person. Yet, there was a sentiment of self-awareness that what he was teaching now was significant. It was a sense of self. It's so beyond. I mean, the sense, we, we all have a sense of self, right? This first paragraph, the oneness of God is so powerful that there is a, um, okay, for the real righteous, it's truly there's no sense of self. For us, it means at least, I'm not thinking about me, I'm not focused on me. I'm focused on the learning. I'm just so engaged in that. I'm focused on the davening. I'm focused on the mitzvah. Whatever it is, I'm just focused on what I need, what I'm needed of, and not what I'm, what I have and gain, and gain wonderful good things. That's the second paragraph. The human condition is about consequence. Reward and punishment. You do good, you get good. You do the opposite, the opposite. But my question though is, how is it that the second paragraph, it's, it's a, a com total calm down. There has to be something significant about the second paragraph that actually you don't even gain in the first paragraph. That you don't have in the first paragraph. What would that be? What could that be? After I've described what the first paragraph is, the Al Sheikh, the Hilaga Al Sheikh, the Arizal walks out on him because there was a sense of self, a sense of some kind of, I don't know, self, I don't know self satisfaction is the right word. I don't know how to say that word, but a sense of an awareness of self that what he was saying was something very significant. At Sadiq, do you ever see here that ever talk? No sense. Oh, this is important. Listen, you know. No, 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 no. 
just a conduit. He's just a vessel too. And he's just telling it as it is in heaven, coming down here. <laughs> There's no, um, well, it's, it's a very high, you know, and significant thing beyond us. So what's, but there has to be something in the second paragraph that is so significant that it's not just merely for us, um, you know, uh, you know, shall we say, you know, they've thrown a bone to us. And there it is. And that is the concept of exile. On the first paragraph, you could only live in the light of God. The second paragraph, and even in the darkness, the times of exile, there you could also serve God. Even when your heart is broken because, uh, Shoshana Bina, you want to hear this. Even when things have happened in your life that your heart is broken and you just see darkness and you don't see any. You don't see light at the end of the tunnel. Yet you serve God. Yet you do what you need to do. You ain't feeling the con connection, but yet you're cl it's clear to you that there is a connection. And you got to do the mitzvah. You got to do what you got to do. So there is a virtue in that. Because in the first level, there is no darkness. It's all light. There's no light. I mean, there's no but light. The second there is the darkness and it's taking into you know, consideration that even in that moment that we all have our challenges, the pain and, and whatnot, that we are still totally committed to Hashem. Yeah, the, the learning isn't uh, going to make us uh, get to that higher level. The learning is just going to help us get through it, a means to an end. All right. That's wonderful. That's beautiful. And you know why? Because as a result of that, we've now refined that element of the world by of me, the world within me, and the world around me that I need to deal with in that dark place. I've refined it. I've elevated. The first paragraph doesn't do it. Doesn't touch there. Doesn't get there. Because there is no darkness. There's only the truth of God. It's only Shema Yisrael. Hashem Echad. No, no, no. Else. Second one is in human condition. And that is uh, very special and dear to Hashem. And ultimately, the purpose. Ah, if that's the purpose, then what do we need the first paragraph? Because we need to know, first of all, that there will come a time that all of this darkness will fade away. And the spirit of folly will and, and impurity will be removed from the world. And we will have the final redemption of Mashiach. That is ultimately, as in the first paragraph, which ties in then for the first, as Rashi explained, Shema Yisrael, here, O Israel, Hashem Elkein Hashem is our God, because he's only our God now. But Hashem Echad, Hashem will be the God of all, of all of humanity, of all nations of the world. Not belief in God as they understand God, but belief in God as we explained last week, transcendence, the imm imminence of God uh, at once, and as it comes from a Jewish perspective, that the entire world will understand and, and, and be aware and commit themselves to that. So um, that, that's the ultimate goal. Yes, we have to go through what we got to go through. But that's the ultimate goal. And at the same time, we need to know that we have to yearn for that, that there should be that light. And that, that sometimes there is that clarity. Again, everything relative, you know, to the Arizal's clarity and the Rebbe's clarity, we're not going to have, but you know, whoever we are and what we are, relatively speaking, yeah, we can have that. So we can have the first paragraph and that will invigorate us and give us the power that's when the, you know, the dark times of exile, 
that we can not get lost in it, but we can um, be refined through it. We refine it. We are exalted through it. That's the thought of the day. Powerful teachings. Anybody has a question? Now, Sharon, you want to say something? Please say. Oh, anybody want to have something to say? Something to ask? Tim, thank you for joining. Marla, uh, Sandy, Jason, my son Mendel. I'm happy that Shana was here. Heather, Alice, Sina, Denise, Linda, Joelle. I guess, I guess we're all holding by the first paragraph of the Shema. It's such clarity, <laughs> which is wonderful. All right, folks. Wishing everybody a good, a good Shabbos, a wonderful Shabbos, and um, we should always celebrate uh, good times. Mashiach now. Amen. 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 All right. Be well. I get Chavez, everybody. Thank you. Chavez. Good Chavez. Chavez.